This week is somewhat different from the first two weeks of the course. Unlike the first two weeks where we had a variety of different things to compute and calculate, in this week we're making the turn from descriptive statistics to inferential statistics. We have a lot of concepts to learn, but very few things to calculate until we get to the last module. You'll find some of the concepts challenging, but it will be a uh, different and somewhat more laid back pace because there are not so many different things to compute. Let's dig in. To talk about inferential statistics, we need to understand exactly what we mean by inference. The dictionary defines it as the act or process of reaching a conclusion about something from known facts or evidence. One of the things we can tell is that inferences cannot be directly observed. We do observe the evidence, and in statistics, we use observations that are organized as variables. For example, when you look outside, if you see in the morning dark clouds, if the air feels cool and humid, and you're seeing puddles on the ground, you might infer that it rained in the night, even though you did not see it raining. You just decided that it was raining in the night because that was the explanation that was the best fit for your observed facts, and so you made an inference. Inferences are always probabilistic. We don't know them with certainty. They're ideas that we hold about things that we did not observe directly. We build our inferences from our general knowledge of how the world operates, our logic and that knowledge are put together to construct a probable explanation. And there are times that we can measure the likelihood that the inference is true. There are some threats to making a good inference, and two of the greatest threats are unobserved influences and poor logic. The scientific method tries to combat the poor logic and the unobserved influences. There are many techniques that reduce the possibility of those unobserved factors. Experiments control and limit the outside influences. When we use random samples, we're avoiding bias in the sample that might happen if they were selected without a random method. And when we define our observation methods with great precision, it means that we can apply them time after time without any variation. Our statistical methods apply a quantity, a probability, to the process of inference so that we can even say how likely it is that our inference is accurate. Module 12 this week takes up the notion of samples and of variables. A sample can be biased if the ones that are chosen in the sample share a trait or they share the lack of a particular trait. In general, we want to have a sample where every unit in the original population has an equal chance of being chosen. In Module 12, we see several different sampling methods, each of which will achieve this, as well as some other types of samples that are sometimes used and the problems they might cause. Module 12 also opens the language of variables, which are well-defined, measured observations that researchers can use in their studies. And in Module 12, we see how a variable can take the role of being an independent or predictor variable, a dependent variable, one that is influenced by the independent variable, or a confounding or extraneous variable. And all of these are dependent not on the variable itself, but on the role it plays in our theory. The rest of our course after this week will look at different kinds of inferential statistics. So we could ask, what sorts of things do we make inferences about? At a very general level, the question, did something happen, is answered by making inferences. We're trying to use a sample to decide if a treatment had an effect or a situation in the real world is having an impact. 
some basic examples of scientific inference, and on the screen you can see the modules where we will be taking up those topics. The notion of a cancer cluster, where one region compared to the population seems to have more cancer than would be expected, we can ask, is there really something going on? Is there an extra number of cancer cases there? Often we want to compare groups. We might be looking at how often people have their children vaccinated and compare a variety of social classes from the elite upper class to the working class with several levels in between. We might be looking at the same group across time. For instance, the level of pain pre-op, post-op, and one year later for a hip replacement patient. We also might be looking at co-occurrence. For instance, do social classes and the uh, presence of asthma go together or not? And finally, covariance, things being uh, a trend that happens at the same time. So across many nations, we see that nations with high female literacy tend to have low child mortality, and that as female literacy goes down, child mortality goes up. Each of these situations requires a particular st statistical technique that fits it, but the general logic of inference is the same in each one. One of the first kinds of inference that we look at beginning in this week is the comparison of one sample to a population. We, in general, know the characteristics of the population, including its dispersion, but we see a subgroup that may differ for reasons that are known or unknown, and we're asking ourselves, is there evidence that the subgroup differs more than would be expected by random chance? And in Module 13, we look at that question and some logically possible errors that can happen in making an inference. In the picture that you see on this screen, on the left-hand side, we have a variety of colors, but mostly greens and blues. And then something happened. We're not sure what, um, perhaps nothing. But on the right-hand side, we see that the dots are larger, and there seem to be more greens and fewer blues. So we need to ask, is this difference something that could have just happened by chance, or do we have evidence to believe that something indeed happened? Similar questions come up when we have a variety of groups that we treat differently with different experimental treatments. So in the picture on this screen, you can see that we have three groups that are pretty much the same on the left-hand side, and then experimental treatments are applied, and we see that one group comes out quite a bit greener, and another group comes out slightly bluer, and the third group stays about the same. Um, one of the things that we'd like to know is to see if those differences are big enough that we would say they were statistically significant and therefore that the treatments had an impact. In Module 14, our textbook will give us the language of being statistically different or significantly different, which has a very specific meaning, unlikely to have occurred by random chance. Module 14 looks at the IQ of an individual and asks how could the individual decide if his or her tested IQ was significantly above average. And the answer to the question uses the probability of specific areas of the normal curve. And the picture here illustrates a range of values that would be thinking our IQ is definitely in the same range as the general population and then two areas where it might be either higher or lower, probably, but we couldn't be sure, and then some areas out in the tail, a small degree of frequency, where we would say the IQ was definitely above average or definitely below average. Module 16 will take up exactly the same question, but at a group level. Now we will be asking, is the IQ of a group of people significantly different than what we would expect from the general population. In Module 16, we will learn how to compare a group's mean to the population mean using a normal curve.
For instance, we know that the mean IQ of health majors is about 111, and the mean IQ of religion and theology majors is 121. But we have a major question we have to ask. Is it legitimate for us to be using the normal curve? Do we have any reason to believe that the group means are, in fact, normal in their distribution? The answer is seen in the sampling distribution of the mean, which I'm presenting very briefly here. There's a separate video that shows um, the app from which these images were taken. The basic notion is that if we repeatedly draw samples from the same population, compute the mean, and then plot those means, we get a chance to see how do sample means behave. And we can see from the illustration here that when the original population is normal, even though the samples are small, in this situation five, their means are also normally distributed and with a lower dispersion than the original population. What if the original population had a skewed distribution? As we can see here, and the other video shows in depth, even with a skewed distribution, when we draw samples of size 10 in the middle or size 25 on the bottom, the distribution of those sample means does tend to be normal, and that as the sample size gets larger, the dispersion of the sample becomes smaller. And in fact, we're able to compute the standard deviation of that distribution, that sampling distribution, and we give it a particular name, the standard error of the mean. Finally, we can ask, what if the underlying population distribution is just plain strange? Here I designed a custom sampling distribution that's not normal, it's not even symmetrical. I drew 100,000 samples of size 5 and size 25 and had their means plotted. And you can see that even though the original distribution was wildly non-normal, that nonetheless, because each sample has scores that balance each other out, we find a normal distribution with broad dispersion when the sample size is small, 5 in the middle, and much less dispersion when the sample size is larger, 25 at the bottom. So a summary of this week's concept would start by saying that inference draws conclusions about populations from samples. The samples have to be scientifically selected, the observations are made using scientific method, and that records of observations are variables which can play various roles in a research study. Our research usually asks, does a treatment or an event affect the sample? Our null hypothesis is no, and then we seek out evidence that would make this null hypothesis unlikely. There is a possibility of making an incorrect inference in two ways that are discussed in our textbook. The central limit theorem lets us use the normal curve it to predict the probability of a particular outcome even if the original distribution was not at all normal. And we define something as unlikely and reject the null hypothesis if our sample mean is found to be within the rejection area of the curve. All the concepts that you study this week come together in the final module when you carry out your first inferential statistical test. You'll definitely notice that this week is more of a conceptual week or a theoretical week than one in which you're com computing and carrying out tests. After this week, we'll look at a variety of inferential tests. Each will be different in its own right, but have the same general principles that you learned this week. Good luck.